full name, the Harry S. Truman Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace. It's a, a, a long name. Uh, I'd like to welcome you for, the, you know, for those of you who it's your first time here at the Institute to welcome you. For those of you who um, have been here before, welcome back. I want to say one or two words simply about uh, the Institute. Um, it, it's, this is one of those, those times where our flexibility in terms of timing is, is limited because we have a clock ticking and people waiting abroad to, for, for connections. Uh, and you're probably already distracted and saying, who is that guy behind his shoulder? Uh, and, and, what, and what is he do, doing there? I mean, I've often felt when I've been doing work at the university that I've had someone looking over my shoulder, seeing what I'm doing. But I think this case, it's especially uh, a real feeling. Um, the Truman Institute was founded more than 40 years ago with the blessing of Harry Truman as the first peace institute in Israel and the Middle East. For more than 40 years, we've been doing work uh, focusing primarily on the Middle East, but also on Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We have public conferences. Uh, this is an example. Uh, we had an earlier uh, conference this year on the 15 years of the peace treaty with Jordan. We were very proud to have a minor role in the conference organized by the Middle Eastern Studies Department from the Abir Foundation this year. We've done a conference this year on globalization in Latin America. We've done a conference in cooperation, cooperation with Ben Gurion University on decolonization in Africa. And we also did it two weeks ago, a conference in Southeast Asia. So you can imagine that we're very busy in, in uh, these aspects. And this, uh, this week is no exception. We also have both research fellows and research groups. And I'll say more about that in a second, but this conference is a result of an ongoing research group that we've had now for, I believe, four years, which has dealt with the question of Iraq, six years already. Um, we, we fund doctoral and, and, and postdoctoral fellows, and we also do grassroots work, working with uh, our Palestinian, especially uh, Palestinian neighbors. Um, with regard to this particular conference, I, given the people who are in this room, I won't even dare to say anything about the significance of the conference or the significance of Iraq uh, today. I'm, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, there, I'm, I'm reminded often of the story of an American who had survived what was famously known in the United States as the Jonestown Flood. And every time he would appear anywhere, he would tell people about his experience surviving the flood. And so when he died and went up to heaven, he was told that everyone had to introduce themselves. He said, oh, that's good. I can tell them about the flood. And the person chairing the session said, well, go right ahead. But just know that Noah is in the audience. So here I have many Noahs in the audience when it comes to Iraq. So I won't discuss the significance of the conference. Simply, I want to say how glad we are to have this gathering. I want to thank um, Noga Efrati for her very, very hard work pulling this together. As in many, often the case with conferences, you think there should be footnotes on the program which explain each speaker and what was involved in getting this speaker and this topic onto the conference. I want to thank Yael, who, who I think isn't here right now, uh, but for all the work that she's done for it. Of course, um, the uh, U.S. Embassy Office of Public Affairs, which we are always so pleased to partner with whenever we're able to organize events and bring American scholars here. The Truman Institute is very much a joint American Friends of the University, Hebrew University event. And so, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm always pleased to stress the American aspect of anything that, that we do. And perhaps foremost, um, I'd like to thank the Center for Iraq Studies, and especially uh, Professor Ahmad Sabar Am, uh, for being our partner for this event. Um, I think for many, many years, uh, Ahmad has been um, Mr. Iraq long before Iraq was particularly as a topic of focus here. And it's my pleasure to ask him to say a few words. Amatsu. Thank you, Steve. I want you to know that for me to, jo to jointly have this uh, conference now with the Harry S. 
is a very nostalgic um, experience. Uh, I was here an assistant working for Amnon Cohen at the uh, Harris Truman Institute, 1976, 1977, 1978. And um, I owe the Harry S. Truman a great deal because I reached a, a brick wall in terms of how to make a living while I was doing my PhD in 1979. And uh, the then head of the Harry S. Truman, and very nice tradition, I know that you continue with this, really, really tried to help me. And uh, it was Tzvi Shifrin, we all remember him, but it was the Harry S. Truman, and they helped me a lot. And thanks to them, I managed to finish my PhD. So it's very nostalgic. Um, I'm very happy on this co uh, that this cooperation worked. Uh, the Center for Iraq Studies at Haifa was really established in 2005. Then it united with another center. Then we separated again. Uh, it's a happy unity and a happy separation. Uh, so uh, we uh, have been there for some time. Uh, and uh, we are also working with the Iraq study group, the Harry S. Truman Institute, uh, all, all the time. Uh, and I believe that this is important for is the Israeli academic community, because I think the research that the Iraq study group does here is really important. As I understand, Amnon, you are going, you are issuing now a book, you are about to issue a book, a, a vol an academic volume that is. We are issuing now an academic volume, and I know that uh, Ofra and the colleague of hers in Tel Aviv are issuing an academic so altogether, I think the Israeli Academy, uh, Israeli universities, of the five, uh, will, will really make um, a difference in, in the next year or so. Um, uh, I would like to thank the, all the people that Steve mentioned, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Naama, Yael, and obviously uh, Amnon, and especially uh, Noga. They know that it is Noga's uh, project. And I'm proud of it because not only that Noga is my ex-PhD student, Noga is also my deputy. She is the, in the old Hebrew, we used to call it unia personalit, a personal union, which means Noga has an, a, a personal union in her personality, that is. Uh, she's both the, uh, the, not the head, I suppose, but I don't know how you are defined here, but the uh, chief organizer with Amnon of the uh, Iraq study group. Just head. Noga herself. Retarded. You are, <laughs> no, you are retired and I'm retarded. So let's, uh, <laughs> so Noga is the organizer and head or whatever of the Iraq study group here. And Noga is my deputy the Iraq Study Center in uh, Haifa, and I would like to thank you, Noga. Um, I believe that this is almost the best time, almost the best time, for a conference on Iraq. In fact, when Amnon, Noga, and myself were sort of trying to look at a, an appropriate date, we thought this would be the ideal moment, because we believed that by now the full results of the elections would be known. So we can really relish in speculation, you know. The way it is, only have about 60 to 80 or maybe some say 85% of the, of the results out so far. Uh, one of our colleagues here thinks that this is all fake. It's all, <laughs> there is no one thing there which is, which is true. It's all, you know, forged. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. It's not, by the way. Some of it is but not too much, and already we can see something, so this is very, we shall discuss it during the conference, in, in the uh, conversations, but I would say we are already seeing something which we could have envisaged coming, we could have seen it coming, namely that no matter how much more, how many more votes Maliki, Prime Minister Maliki, is, is getting, it seems like he's getting the largest number of votes, 
But even had it not been the case, that all three major competitors on the Arab side of, of Iraq would have got more or less the same, which is not the case. But anyway, the other com the two competitors got quite a lot of the same. No matter how much he gets, and he'll certainly get like the others, if not more, he will be the best candidate to build a government, a coalition. It's very much the Israeli system. Uh, and, uh, and because he is a middle-of-the-way candidate, he positioned himself. He is not uh, in the Iranian pocket, definitely not, but he's close to Iran. He is not in the American pocket, but he's close to America. He is not, he is personally very religious, but if the party comes under not very religious slogan, and so it looks like mm, middle-of-the-way, and he can, he can build a coalition. Uh, I would just say that the coalition he builds will decide the, the fate of Iraq. That's the way I look at it. Very simply, if he builds a coalition with the other Shi'i party, which is really almost purely Shi'i, and certainly very religious, and certainly very pro-Iranian, then I would say America lost. And I would say Israel lost as well. If he builds a coalition with others, he can do a mega coalition if he wants. But if he doesn't want that, if he builds it with others, then not all is lost. Definitely not. Because I believe that he is a real first-class ex-grinder. He is as cynical as they come. And he'll do what's, going, what's good for him, personally. So we'll wait and see. But I think this is a very exciting moment for all of us. And I'm no longer the, the expert on Iraq and Israel. We have today about five, six, seven maybe wonderful experts, probably the best, the Israeli academy being very small, we are probably the best uh, reservoir of, of real Iraq experts in the world, even though you have many very good Iraq experts here and there and here and there. But in one small country, this is a very unique thing, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, so I wish all of us a, a successful conference. I think it's going to be really interesting. And again, Steve, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to come with Truman. And maybe by cooperating with you, I'm returning 1% of the all you. Thank you very much. the exact time, but uh, we have about 10 minutes for the You can. I have to, I have to, as so often is the case, we often say in Hebrew uh, when I was the dean, the <laughs> uh, I have to go teach. Yeah. I have to go teach. And that best for fruitful deliberations. Hello, my name is Non Cohen. Hi, my name is Professor Cohen, and I'm trying to uh, kill some minutes until we get the other party online. They are there already, but he kindly uh, moved out of the scene when he saw us, and uh, the part that is not very much interesting for him. So let's just make the best out of the five minutes, extra minutes, so that we just don't rush out and uh, grab some sandwiches unnecessary. Uh, uh, the uh, one vignette, one uh, small story uh, which I'll share with you, which, I, which, doesn't, which has to do with the person we're going to listen to soon, or rather with his university, uh, has a very interesting Israeli angle. And since it doesn't concern Iraq, I won't refer to it um, in my introduction, but uh, why shouldn't I share it with you? Um, when we managed to uh, get uh, Mr. Crocker to agree to uh, take part in our conference, I uh, knew that he was serving at a university which is called Texas A&M University. I didn't know anything about it. I knew what Texas was. I knew what the university is. But I didn't know anything about what A&M and, and PM. I then knew there was a university like this. Anyhow, A&M st stands for... Uh, I read a little bit about it. Stands for Agriculture and Mechanics. Uh, that is, the f this is a university, uh, one of the most, the most important one in Texas, I believe, one of the 20 uh, most important in in the states. Uh, that's what uh, Google says. Um, and it was uh, has been functioning for over more than 150 years. It's an, an, an old university and a very important, a large one. 
Um, uh, so it still is referred to as an A&M. And, &M, and um, um, I looked at the general information to find out what's, whether they teach Middle East, for instance, whether they teach, have humanities. They're not very big on humanities. But uh, the thing that grabbed my attention was a name that we are all familiar with, which is Senator Mitchell. And when I saw Mitchell, I said, oh, at long last, there's something which has to do with the Israeli, Arab Israeli conflict. Oh, we'll have, perhaps, uh, we'll have salvation and solution coming from over there. So I looked, I read, this, what is it he has to do? He had been there too at the time, but this is no big deal. The thing is that uh, Senator Mitchell, the one who's, I believe, coming today, later today to Israel, has, um, been extremely generous towards that university. He donated a very substantial sum of money, which I'll mention by way of impressing you, to set up, to build a new center for fundamental physics, nothing to do with our uh, Middle Eastern topics. And there's a huge, impressive uh, um, scheme and, and, and uh, how this is going to take place. It will take about three years to build it. and. They'll have a telescope, a huge telescope installed and so on. And you may understand that these things cost money, even more than a faculty of humanities. And he, uh, this, will, this is, has already been named after him and his wife. We know him personally because he was here uh, at the big hall about uh, four or five years ago. We honored him with the Truman Peace Prize. So we had the chance of meeting him and his wife. So uh, he donated uh, to that particular uh, institute of physics the princely sum of $44.5 million. And it will be called uh, Mr. Mitchell and his wife, I, I believe it's Catherine or something, um, uh, Institute for Physics, um, uh, named after Senator Mitchell. So uh, we are very jealous, of course, when you hear that someone gives, whom we know gives out his money to a university, which is rightly, where it should rightly go, in the US rather than to, uh, to this part of the world. But, uh, but uh, more seriously, it's a very impressive um, contribution and um, one more good point to, uh, towards his efforts in this part of the world. Good morning. Hi, uh, Dean Crocker. How are you? Well, I'm uncommonly well. Yourself? Uh, uncommonly well? What's so uncommon about it? You in uh, the U.S., I understand, are always well, uh, uh, doing fine. Uh, the problems are in this part of the world rather than over there. They, they are, and it's, uh, it's great to be here in College Station, Texas, and nobody's shooting at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's probably very early in the morning over there, and we appreciate very much. And we, uh, we once again apologize for having you to get up, but I guess you get up in any event quite early in the morning because there's so much to be done over there. So we thank you once, much, once again. And uh, without further ado, let's start with the uh, formal, even though we have some 60, 70 seconds left. But uh, since you are there and I'm here, and the audience is already expecting, um, waiting breathlessly to listen to you, to hear you. So why don't I do the introduction and... Uh, We'll start rolling, okay, with you? <clears throat> well, uh, once again, uh, this time it's me uh, adding my humble voice, um, welcoming you all and uh, congratulating this conference, congratulating first and foremost Noga, of course, who is still running around. No, she's here, that's okay. So everything is already solved. So uh, congratulated, uh, congratulating Truman, the Truman Institute, of course, we just heard the uh, president of the Truman Institute, congratulating Noga, and most particularly congratulating you all, um, our dear participants in the seminar, in the conference, both those who came from overseas and our Israeli uh, colleagues, and wishing you all, or should I say wishing us all, um, a most successful conference. Moving to the more substantive part of the uh, conference, now we start the real thing. <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, former ambassador, presently dean and executive professor at George Bush School of Government at A&M Texas University, Ryan Crocker. 
In the course of his rich career of almost 40 years in the Foreign Service, Dean Crocker received an impressive variety of awards and medals for distinguished service and exceptional courage and leadership. He served in many Muslim and Middle Eastern countries. Among them, he was ambassador to Pakistan, definitely a Muslim and non-Middle Eastern country, but also ambassador to Lebanon, to Syria, to Kuwait, among others, and most recently to Iraq until about a year ago. It's then, in 2009-2009, that he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is America's highest civilian award. We feel that we are also awarded, not just he was awarded, we are also awarded and privileged by Dean Crocker, who graciously agreed to share with us his insights and impressions from Iraq, where he served, I know at least, of two, um, ten, two periods. First, he served there at the beginning, uh, during the 2003, at the beginning of um, the post-Saddam period, in various capacities. And then, of course, in the, he served during the crucially important years of 2007 up to 2009 as an ambassador. We all recall the alarming deterioration of the security situation in Iraq prior to the surge, quote unquote, announced by President Bush in 2006. And we are fully aware of the gradual but steady improvement of the situation in Iraq during the last three years, which led to the signing of the agreement between the government on Iraq, of Iraq and the United States, leading to the, um, the this debt, uh, that is the SEFTA agreement, which was the strategic framework agreement of 2008 during the tenure of Ambassador Crocker. And this was a, a the top uh, important uh, document which, chart, which charted the gradual pullout of American forces from Iraq, which is due to start uh, rolling actually later this year. Iraq is hopefully returning to normalcy, I said hopefully, and uh, last week's general election is yet elections that Amatia are related to is yet another indication in that direction. Once again, sir, we are thankful and delighted to have you with us. And we are looking forward to listening to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Ryan Crocker. Please, sir, the stage is yours. Uh, Professor Cohen, uh, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to be with you today for this very important conference. Um, I uh, commend the uh, Truman Institute and the University of Haifa uh, for sponsoring this event uh, to uh, keep an international focus on Iraq. Uh, too often, I think, that uh, we in the West uh, certainly in this country, tend to see Iraq now as yesterday's war, uh, when it is very much uh, uh, today's, uh, if not war, at least issue, and it will be tomorrow's as well. Uh, I also was very interested to, to listen to Professor Kaplan go through the list of the many activities that the Truman Institute uh, sponsors, and I, I am reminded of what a an enormous contribution the Institute has made over the years uh, to efforts at peace in a troubled region um, and certainly efforts at better understanding. We all owe you a debt. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Professor Cohen, uh, Texas A&M and its uh, association with uh, Senator Mitchell. Uh, the university is, uh, is active in the Middle East in a, a number of areas, including in Iraq, uh, where they have had a very successful program to uh, help redevelop uh, Iraqi agriculture. Uh, and with that experience, uh, the university is now also moving into Afghanistan to uh, attempt a, a similar contribution to the uh, uh, Afghan economy, the um, effort to grow something besides poppies. Um, <laughs> Uh, as you note, I spent almost four decades in the, uh, in the Foreign Service, 
I, I came here to the Bush School of Government and Public Service uh, because while there are a lot of good schools of uh, public policy and public administration in this country, uh, the Bush School is a school of public service. Over 70% of our graduates, and, and we only have graduate students, a master's program, over 70% of them do go into public service, uh, state, local, federal, or, um, or nonprofits. Um, and again, having spent um, uh, my, Professor Cohen, were you attempting to reverse the charges? <laughs> Well, who speaks of money when we deal with high and uh, lofty ideas like democracy, freedom, and the future of the Middle East? Uh, as I was saying, I mean, spent my career in uh, public service. It is um, uh, hugely satisfying now to play a role in um, uh, shaping the experience of those young Americans uh, who go will go forward to serve our nation nationally and internationally. So. Uh, it's a long way from Baghdad to College Station, but the, um, the spirit is still the same. Uh, you, you mentioned my experience in Iraq. My asso direct association with Iraq uh, actually goes back quite a ways. I, I was first um, sent to Baghdad in 1978 um, and spent uh, two years there. That, of course, was the... Um, the period in which Saddam Hussein uh, formally assumed the leadership um, in 1979. So I had the opportunity in those years, I left just before the beginning of the Iraq-Iran war, uh, to see firsthand what uh, a police state is really like, uh, as Kanan Makia has described it, the Republic of Fear. Uh, I, I have been in some difficult places before, uh, I have dealt with other authoritarian re regimes, such as in Syria, uh, but there was nothing quite like Iraq. Uh, uh, I had uh, the experience in 1990, after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, invasion of Kuwait, to serve as director of the uh, State Department's Iraq-Kuwait Task Force. Um, uh, during the period of Desert Shield uh, leading up to Desert Storm when I, I was sent off to, uh, to Lebanon. Um, and then in 1998, I, I was back in Baghdad um, as the U.S. diplomatic representative to the uh, well-known UNSCOM Presidential Palace inspection team. Um, and as such, I was the, the first American diplomat uh, to set foot in Iraq since, uh, since 1990. Um, and there I had the occasion to uh, uh, actually see the Iraqi leadership uh, uh, in, in action. The um, uh, Tariq Aziz made several visits to the places we were inspecting, um, uh, and I actually had some conversations with um, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, infamous personal secretary who drove me around the Republican palace complex in Baghdad to point out the uh, palaces where uh, Saddam's um, sons-in-law had lived before their defection to, um, uh, to Jordan. Um, uh, and I had the distinctly uncomfortable feeling that I was in the car with the man who had arranged their murders on their return. Um, I came back in 03 and subsequently um, 2007 to 2009, I, um, I did so with what was then rare for Americans, um, uh, some direct experience and, um, and contact with the, uh, the old order in Iraq, and I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. Um, uh, I thought I'd start by uh, picking up where Pro Professor Baram left off, um, uh, the Iraqi elections and their significance. Uh, I, I do so with um, a strong sense of modesty and even trepidation. Uh, uh, there are Noahs in the room, as Professor <laughs> Kaplan said, uh, and uh, Professor Baram uh, certainly is one of them whose work I have admired over the years. Um, uh, but you asked me to speak, so here I am. Um, 
the elections. Uh, the elections are significant in many respects. Uh, I would start with the simple fact that unlike the, uh, the last national elections or even the 2009 provincial elections, these elections were secured not by Americans but by Iraqis. Uh, uh, Iraqi security forces uh, were present throughout the country um, and I think did a very credible job of um, ensuring that Iraqis could get to the polls. 62% uh, uh, of them did. Uh, uh, perhaps not unusual by Israel standards, but by American standards, um, um, uh, better than almost any election in our recent past. Um, so in the hands of Iraqis, with Americans as a ready reserve, uh, and important in that sense, but uh, one measure of the distance uh, Iraq has now traveled, uh, I think can be seen by the, the shifting role of now Iraqis up front. Uh, three years ago when I first arrived in, uh, in Baghdad in the middle of a virtual civil war, I, uh, I never dreamed that um, uh, in three short years we could see what we saw on the, uh, the 7th of March. Um, as Professor Barham notes, uh, uh, it looks like this is going to be a, uh, a pretty even outcome uh, among the three top uh, coalitions. Um, uh, that of Prime Minister Maliki, that of Ayad Alawi, um, and the Iraqi National Alliance um, of the um, uh, other Shia parties. Uh, I think we, all of us who follow Iraq, uh, had the strong sense going into these elections that there would be no single victor, uh, no single list that would be in a position to, uh, by itself, form a government, and that indeed is exactly what has happened. Um, uh, so now the uh, the curtain comes up on the real play. The elections were just a prologue. The process of government formation now begins in earnest, and everyone is talking to everyone, uh, uh, which I think is exactly as it should be. Um, uh, no one is excluding participation in anyone else's coalition at this point. Uh, uh, I would expect that we were we are probably looking at process that will be measured in uh, in months rather than weeks, certainly was the case in 2006. Um, uh, it does appear that uh, uh, Maliki's list uh, uh, is slightly ahead of his competitors. Um, whether that actually will give him uh, sufficient leverage to lead a new government, I think is very much an open question. Uh, there is a phenomenon that I saw when I was out there, and I think if anything has intensified, of uh, Maliki versus the rest. Uh, uh, many in the Iraqi leadership uh, uh, have been critical of what they refer to as his dictatorial style. Um, the Kurdish leadership, uh, particularly uh, Masoud Barzani, uh, has absolutely no great affection for Mr. Maliki, uh, uh, nor does uh, uh, Iyad Alawi uh, or Tariq al-Hashimi, uh, the, uh, the Sunni vice president. Uh, so I can imagine many outcomes. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, Maliki's continuation as prime minister. Uh, but uh, predictions really are not possible at this point any more than they were in 2006. Um, when a largely unknown uh, figure of no national significance whatsoever was finally chosen as a compromise candidate because everyone felt he was uh, too weak to be a threat to anyone's interest, that of course was Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, uh, there are several other observations I think worth noting uh, about the elections. Uh, just as there needs to be a combination of lists, there are going to be some interesting developments, I think, within lists. Uh, 
uh, in other words, a, the lists themselves are, are coalitions. Um, and a coalition that may have been able to come together for an election uh, might not be able to necessarily emerge intact uh, through the process of negotiation and government formation. Uh, uh, the Iraqi National Alliance, for example, uh, is uh, by no means a natural grouping, uh, bringing together, as it, uh, as it were, uh, both the Sadrists um, um, and um, uh, uh, Amar Hakim's ISKI uh, with its leading political figure, uh, Adil Abdul Mahdi. Uh, uh, these are uh, intense uh, rivals for power, um, ideological rivals uh, in the Shia context. Um, so in addition to watching what the different lists do, um, in negotiations with each other, I think we need to keep an eye on the dynamics uh, within the list because we're now in a different process uh, than we were during the political campaign itself. Um, uh, it's worth also reflecting on uh, uh, what the results as we know them uh, tell us about political and sectarian divides uh, in the country. Um, uh, uh, Iyad Alawi, of course, a Shia, but closely associated uh, with the, the secular trend in Iraq uh, and with strong Sunni allies, uh, appears to have had a very good showing uh, in the uh, predominantly Sunni parts of the country, uh, uh, but not so much uh, in the Shia areas uh, throughout the south. Um, although I, I did read that uh, uh, in every province he got at least 10% of the vote, uh, in, including the, the southern provinces uh, dominated by the Shia. Maliki, conversely, uh, while doing ex uh, quite well in Baghdad and much of the south, uh, appears to have done very poorly in the uh, predominantly Sunni areas uh, to the north and west. Uh, getting as few as one or two percent of the vote in Anbar, I understand, from the, uh, the preliminary results. Uh, uh, so uh, although many of these lists were cross-sectarian, uh, at least in name, uh, uh, we see the spirit of sectarianism uh, once again making itself manifest in the, um, the pattern of voting. Uh, uh, I would make a comment about the role of uh, Ayatollah Sistani. Uh, uh, he was extremely careful, as uh, I re read it, to avoid uh, any action that could be interpreted as the endorsement of uh, any given candidate. Uh, so Iraq may not have uh, quite the separation of church and state that uh, uh, we pride ourselves on in this country. Uh, but I think we once again have seen uh, the Grand Ayatollah uh, uh, play a role of, um, uh, of great circumspection. Uh, and as the history of Iraq is written, uh, I think we may find that uh, uh, Ayatollah Sistani's Excellent. I think we may find that um, Ayatollah Sistani's role uh, uh, could have been decisive in, in bringing Iraq uh, as far as it has come uh, simply by uh, his uh, uh, refusal to directly intervene in political matters. Um, we also saw this incidentally during the negotiation of uh, the two agreements uh, uh, that were mentioned previously, the security agreement and the strategic framework agreement. Uh, he told both the prime minister and the prime minister's critics uh, that these were matters for politicians to decide and for the parliament to vote on. Uh, uh, they were not the proper subject of decrees from Najaf. So, 
again, this clerical restraint uh, exhibited by uh, Sistani personally and the, uh, the Najaf Hausa in general, uh, I think have been key elements. Uh, I, I thought I'd say just a word about uh, some of these major actors. Um, um, there is no way in which I can match the uh, the knowledge and learning um, present in that room, um, but I, I did have the uh, advantage of being physically on the ground uh, those uh, those two decisive years, and I came to know the uh, uh, the players uh, reasonably well. Uh, whether it's uh, you know Nouri al Maliki, uh, Tarq al Hashimi, Ayad Alawi, um, uh, Adil Abdul Mahdi, uh, uh, Interior Minister Bolani, I, I spent a lot of long hours with uh, with all of them. Uh, there are several general impressions um, that uh, registered with me quite strongly. Uh, uh, First, these are men of extraordinary courage, uh, uh, political courage and personal courage. Uh, 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 they have all been the target of assassination attempts at different times. Uh, uh, they have all lost family members uh, uh, to uh, actions by Saddam's regime or other terrorist attacks, yet they do not quit. Um, uh, uh, they are in the game, they're in the game for keeps. Uh, an American ambassador may be out there for two long years, um, and they were long years, uh, mm. but uh, uh, it, it's their country, and uh, they are determined to, uh, to fight for their, uh, their vision of its future. Uh, and I would say here as well, uh, although their national visions may differ, and do differ, um, they are all committed Iraqi nationalists. Uh, 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 some have varying degrees of ties to outside powers, but I, I believe, as Professor Barham mentioned, uh, uh, no outside power calls the shots in Iraq. Uh, when I, I come to the region, I'll talk about that in a little more detail with respect to Iran. Um, uh, uh, Iraqis have the reputation as uh, <clears throat> being the uh, toughest guys uh, uh, on the Arab bloc in the Middle East, uh, uh, and I think that's true. Uh, whichever side of the fight they're on, uh, uh, with you or against you, uh, they are they are they are formidable fighters indeed. Uh, the same, of course, is true of the Kurdish leaders. Uh, uh, Masoud Barzani and Jalal Talabani, and uh, I'll talk about this in a little more detail too as we look at the uh, uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, Barzani and Talabani, of course, are very different in their personal styles. Uh, 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 Talabani, uh, gregarious, outgoing, um, and in touch with everyone. Uh, Masoud Barzani still very much uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Kurdish leader, still very much the uh, the Peshmerga commander he has always been, uh, very loath to leave uh, the mountains of the north. Uh, the challenges ahead. Um, first, I, I would come back to an early point. Uh, Iraq. Uh, as the Republic of Fear. I, I said at one point in my congressional testimony with General Petraeus uh, that if I could only choose one word uh, to describe Iraq and Iraqi society, that word would be fear. Um, uh, more than two years later, uh, I, I would say there is now uh, substantial hope, uh, but fear is still a dominant factor. Uh, one way I have put it uh, is to say that uh, uh, the Sunnis 
are afraid of the future, uh, uh, afraid that their loss of ascendancy uh, after hundreds and hundreds of years of literally calling the shots in Baghdad um, could put the um, entire community in jeopardy. Uh, so the Sunnis are afraid of the past. The Shia are afraid of the future. Um, that, that somehow uh, the revolution of 2003 uh, is going to be toppled by the inexorable forces of history. Um, and that the Sunnis, more particularly the Ba'ath Party, will once again emerge ascendant. So the Shia fear the future. And the Kurds, as they, they put it themselves, uh, given their history and the uncertainty um, of their prospects, fear both the past and the future. Um, uh, and I think it's important to, to bear this in mind, uh, because uh, when you are existentially afraid, uh, compromise becomes very difficult. Uh, uh, for many Iraqis, uh, politics is not uh, just about uh, winning or losing elections, and if you lose, uh, you go back home, reorganize, regroup, and campaign another day. Um, uh, there is also the fear, uh, based on history, both recent and past, uh, that you can lose a lot more than an election. Uh, uh, so, again, for Americans, to understand that um, uh, uh, these are not like the Texas primary elections. Um, um, and I think for Israelis to understand that uh, uh, while the Iraqi system, as Professor Barham pointed out, uh, uh, I think looks a great deal like the Israeli system, uh, uh, the underlying climate, I think, is, is radically different. Um, so what are the challenges uh, ahead? Um, uh, I think we all know them, but uh, I'll just mention them as, a, as markers for later conversation. Um, uh, we have seen sectarian violence ebb. Uh, it, it's what I call a virtuous circle. The, uh, uh, the surge that commenced at the beginning of 2007, uh, that gave Sunnis, particularly in the west of the, of the country initially, the confidence that we had their backs, uh, the American military, and that they could now step forward against Al-Qaeda, uh, not only brought into being uh, the awakening movement, it profoundly reshaped Iraqi politics. Uh, because the Shia came to notice that uh, uh, Sunni Arabs were now not attacking them, but were instead attacking a common enemy. Um, over time, this changed attitudes within the Shia community toward Jaysh al-Mahdi, um, which increasingly came to be seen not as an essential protector uh, against a Sunni adversary, um, uh, but as a, uh, a militia involved in uh, deeply unpopular and damaging acts. Uh, uh, that shift in opinion in the Shia community is what created the climate that allowed um, uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki to order the charge of the Knights uh, against Jaysh al-Mahdi in, uh, in Basra and Baghdad in the spring of 2008. Um, uh, even if he had capable forces, which I don't think he did, he would not have had a political environment in which he could have carried that out uh, uh, nine months earlier. Um, uh, Charge of the Knights, in turn, led to a Sunni reassessment uh, of the Prime Minister and uh, uh, his attributes as a leader. And you may recall it was a few months uh, after that successful campaign um, that uh, the Sunni coalition to uh, rejoined the Baghdad government. Um, uh, the honeymoon with Maliki, of course, was fairly brief, uh, but Tawafik was back to stay. Um, and there was no longer uh, any talk of a serious uh, Sunni boycott of government or of elections. Um, 
so again, a virtuous circle, if you will, uh, in my view, uh, triggered initially by the surge. But we then see how complex uh, Iraq is. Uh, if sectarian violence and sectarian tension has subsided, uh, ethnic tension, of course, has increased. Uh, so we're back. Has, ethnic tension has increased uh, between Kurds and Arabs, um, uh, as we've seen very clearly. Um, and I, I think here the U.S. role has been extremely important, uh, both military and civilian, uh, to engage representatives on both sides, uh, civilian politicians, um, local leaders, uh, and the respective militaries uh, in a variety of mechanisms uh, and efforts uh, to, to keep tensions from, um, from exploding. And this will be an ongoing process. Um, I, I had numerous discussions during my time there with uh, both leaders in Baghdad and leaders in Kurdistan. And with the Kurds, I, I'd start out by asking the question, um, uh, what, what were the worst of times uh, for the Kurds of Iraq? And you'd get a spirited debate uh, because there were a lot of very bad times to choose from. Uh, most of them believed that Anfal was the worst. Um, but as I said, there was debate. When I posed the second question, um, what were the best of times? There was no debate. The best of times are right now, it's today. Uh, uh, this is as good as it's ever been. Uh, an autonomous Kurdish region, uh, uh, their own military forces, 17% of national oil revenues, uh, 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 no security threats, uh, this is as good as it's ever gotten. And my comment to that was, right, don't blow it. Uh, uh, do not get into a shooting war with the federal government, or this can all come apart on you again. Um, uh, so we'll see. Um, uh, a great deal needs to be managed there. Uh, the issue of Kirkuk, where the Kurds, of course, are now claiming that uh, uh, their long-awaited referendum has actually been held on March 7th with the national elections, um, and they have triumphed. Um, uh, the Arabs, of course, and the Turkmen taking a very different view. Uh, so this new government, when it uh, is formed, is going to have to take on uh, the whole issue of uh, Kurdish-Arab differences, um, be they Kirkuk, uh, disputed internal borders, um, or very fundamental issues about the shape and nature of the Iraqi state. Um, uh, for example, uh, issues of the relative authorities and responsibilities of the federal government in Baghdad, vis-a-vis -vis the regional government in Erbil, vis-a-vis -vis the provincial governments in the rest of the country, um, uh, are by no means resolved. Um, uh, for Americans, some of these debates sound very familiar. They're similar to our own states' rights controversies um, in the earlier part of our history. Um, I, I was getting ready to deliver yet another anodyne Fourth of July address in 2008 when a young member of my staff in an effort to get me to say something reasonably interesting, pointed out that if one dates the uh, foundation of the modern Iraqi state to the establishment of the monarchy in 1921, Iraq in 2008 was 87 years old. Uh, if you add 87 years to July 4th, 1776, it's the day after the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, the decisive uh, battle in the American Civil War. Um, the point being, uh, we did not get the states' rights issues sorted out in this country uh, in, in our early days, and the country almost came apart uh, nine decades later. Uh, Iraq is wrestling with some of these same issues uh, that, that we had to face. Uh, I, I certainly hope they do, they do better than we did and they do it quicker than we did. 
but no one should underestimate the difficulty, particularly against the backdrop of uh, Iraq's modern history under the, uh, the Ba'ath and Saddam Hussein. Uh, uh, there are significant constitutional issues. Uh, um, I remember conversations with Prime Minister al-Maliki and uh, Vice President Tariq al-Hashimi on the same day in which uh, Maliki complained that the Constitution gives the Prime Minister uh, too little power. Uh, he uh, uh, complained, for example, that while President Bush could sign our two agreements as an executive order, he was required to take it to Parliament for a vote and uh, felt very strongly the Constitution should be amended uh, to strengthen the power of the Prime Minister. Uh, Tariq al-Hashimi on the same day also agreed that the Constitution should be amended, um, but he argued strongly that it should be amended to reduce the powers of the Prime Minister. Um, so there is a lively and unresolved constitutional debate on a number of points going forward that um, uh, the Iraqis will have to deal with. Uh, uh, related to that are institutional questions. Um, under uh, Ayad Samarai, I think we have seen the Council of Representatives uh, play a, a more robust and a more effective role. Um, but the, the lines of uh, responsibility between the executive and the legislative branch uh, are by no means clear. Uh, and I think there will be a controversial testing of those limits uh, as we move forward. Um, there is the question of rule of law, the role of the judiciary and corruption, uh, a huge challenge to the, uh, the new Iraqi state. Uh, uh, at the time I left Baghdad, 36 judges uh, had been assassinated since uh, 2004 when Iraq uh, regained its sovereignty. Um, it's, it, it's hard to expect full judicial integrity uh, on the bench uh, when those phone calls come in, and they do come in, um, telling a judge that uh, if he rules the wrong way, they know where he lives, and they know where his kids go to school, and they have a track record to back it up, especially when they add that it doesn't have to be that way. If he does the right thing, um, uh, he's going to be set for life. So enormous challenges uh, to, to the rule of law uh, in Iraq, and we all know uh, how corrosive and uh, uh, negative a failure to establish rule of law can be. Uh, uh, there is also the question of control over the military, a big question in Iraq. Um, the uh, uh, Prime Minister has set up uh, uh, operational commands in key areas of the country uh, that report directly to him through his office of the Commander-in-Chief, uh, not through the uh, uh, Defense Ministry. Uh, his critics complain that he is once again exhibiting uh, authoritarianism, uh, he would argue it's the only way that he can ensure as prime minister uh, that he has effective civilian control over his military. And this being Iraq, uh, with its history, uh, these are not, shall we say, academic matters. Uh, so, I just say a word about the persistence of political culture in Iraq. My <laughs> good friend and former colleague, um, David Petraeus, has called it Iraqracy, um, um, their own distinctive blend, uh, brand of democracy, um, in, in which we see that authoritarian tendency. Uh, it is present in Maliki. Um, I think it's, in pre it's present in, in almost all of uh, Iraq's current leaders. Um, with varying opportunities for them to exercise it. Um, certainly you see authoritarianism in the north. Um, um, I am not sure if Masoud Barzani is president for life in the Kurdish region, um, but, but many think that is exactly his, uh, his intention. Uh, uh, 
His critics call Maliki, you know, the new Saddam. He is very far from that. But um, I think it's worth dusting off the chapters in the history books about the, um, the reign of Abdul Karim Qasim and how he uh, maneuvered politically, building up allies here, putting the hammer down on adversaries there, then reversing the process um, until he eventually ran out of room. Uh, uh, from the time of uh, Hajjaj bin Yusuf until today, Iraq is very, very hard to govern. Um, and uh, we, we will see that, I think, in this period going forward. Um, uh, all of this argues for, in my view, sustained U.S. engagement. Um, uh, we cannot let Iraq become yesterday's war, uh, or it will, I think, almost assuredly be tomorrow's disaster. Uh, uh, we do not call the shots in Iraq any longer. Actually, we haven't for some time, and that's good. Um, Iraqis need to make these decisions because they're the ones who will have to live with the consequences. Um, but we have a critical role, um, increasingly behind the scenes. Uh, we exercise that role, I think, very effectively in the run-up to the elections and the painful process of devising a an elections law that would work. Uh, we play it every day uh, between Kurds and Arabs. Um, and we will need to go on playing it through this tricky process of government formation and the, uh, uh, the many challenges I've tried to outline that will then be in front of this new government. Uh, um, uh, we don't play it effectively by uh, making pronouncements or deciding what agenda is appropriate for Iraq and um, working to get them to execute it. We play it by listening, seeing what the possibilities are, uh, working quietly with the whole range of the political leadership uh, uh, in Iraq to do everything we can to bring them to a more stable place. Uh, I would say the consequences of that are significant for America, uh, for Israel, for the entire international community. Uh, we have an architecture. The, the two agreements uh, that I was involved in negotiating in, throughout 2008 uh, lay out a framework for a future relationship, both the security agreement that provides for a phased drawdown of uh, US forces, but more importantly, the strategic framework agreement uh, that is a roadmap for cooperation uh, politically, diplomatically, economically, in education, in culture, in science and technology. Uh, I am heartened to see the Obama administration uh, give high level attention to uh, Iraq, uh, uh, primarily through the uh, efforts of Vice President Biden. Uh, uh, it's important that those efforts uh, continue. Because if uh, security continues to take hold in Iraq, uh, and if uh, Iraq uh, continues its reorientation toward the West, uh, the political map of the Middle East will be fundamentally altered. Uh, since the 58 revolution, uh, Iraq has been a challenge to the West, to the West, to the international order. Uh, uh, Iraq now has the opportunity uh, to play a fundamentally different role, uh, uh, and that is certainly enough to warrant uh, all of our continued constructive engagement. Now, if you permit me just a word about the region, Iraq is hard enough in isolation, uh, um, but it does not exist in isolation. It is a tough part of a very tough neighborhood. Uh, I start with Iran, that has had much of our focus, uh, and there was a lot of concern uh, in this country and elsewhere that somehow Iran was going to uh, take over Iraq. Uh, uh, when I arrived there at the beginning of 2007, and as I looked at uh, Iraq's neighbors to the east and west, uh, Iran and Syria, I, I had the uncomfortable feeling that I was back in Lebanon uh, uh, about 25 years earlier. Um, 
I, I was in Beirut in 1982 when uh, Hezbollah was created under uh, Iranian and Syrian auspices. Uh, and as I looked at Al-Qaeda, at uh, Syria's support for Al-Qaeda transit, uh, uh, the haven they had given to senior Ba'athi leaders, and Iran's support for Jaysh al-Mahdi, um, I, I felt very much as I was seeing the same bad movie uh, played a second time on a bigger stage. Um, uh, and this may indeed have been what uh, Iran intended. Um, uh, we tend to lose sight here, I think you less so because of proximity, of the fact that Iran and Iraq fought a vicious eight-year ground war, uh, uh, the scars of which uh, deeply affect the peoples on both sides. Um, uh, uh, some key Iranian national security figures, such as um, uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, were in that war. And uh, I've heard the theory advanced that for the uh, Iranian leadership, uh, 1988 uh, uh, was uh, just a truce. It wasn't the end of the war. Um, and that Iranians would like to finish that war as victors. Uh, and that that is what drives policy, particularly from the uh, IRGC Quds Force. Um, but Iraq isn't Lebanon, as Iraqis uh, will very quickly tell you. Uh, and I found the, the willingness of Prime Minister al-Maliki and other leaders uh, to confront Iran um, uh, on some key issues to be proof of that. The key example, I think, is the negotiation of the two agreements. Uh, it was very clear Iran did not want to see those agreements concluded. Um, uh, and applied a lot of pressure on Maliki and others, um, uh, which he simply brushed off. Uh, at one point he said, you know, the more they push, the more we're going to push back. Um, uh, so there are clear limits to Iranian influence uh, in Iraq. I think they can be uh, destructive. They certainly tried to be uh, with their backing for Jaysh al-Mahdi and other groups like Saad al-Haq. Um, but they cannot impose an agenda. Um, they could not impose, for example, a unified uh, Shia list this time, uh, such as uh, characterized the 2005 elections. So, uh, you know, we will have to stay engaged as a counterweight to the Iranians, but at the same time, we should not overestimate their, um, uh, their influence. Um, uh, Iraq, indeed, is, uh, is not Lebanon. Uh, Turkey has been very interesting, uh, uh, particularly since the uh, advent of uh, Ahmed Davutoglu as the foreign minister. Uh, you would have a better sense, I think, from your perspective, uh, but I, I sometimes think I see the emergence of uh, almost an Ottomanist uh, foreign policy with uh, uh, Turkey now more engaged in the region than they historically have been. Uh, certainly more engaged in Iraq. Uh, in uh, February 2008, uh, Turkish forces carried out a ground incursion into northern Iraq uh, in pursuit of the PKK, uh, causing enormous internal strain uh, inside the country. Um, uh, now uh, we have a situation in which uh, Ankara's ties to Baghdad are, uh, are strong, and even more significant, I think, Ankara's ties with Erbil um, uh, have reached a, an unprecedented level, so that Turkish leaders will actually go up to Erbil um, to meet with um, uh, Kurdish President Barzani, unthinkable, uh, just a few years ago. Um, and in the overall effort uh, to uh, calm Kurdish uh, Arab tensions within Iraq, I think the, uh, the Turks can be a powerful and, um, and positive force. Um, um, 
Syria remains a challenge. Um, and again, the persistence of history and of political culture. Uh, uh, Damascus and Baghdad uh, almost never exist in harmony. Um, uh, it's as old as history, that rivalry. And we have certainly seen it uh, reemerge again in the last few years as Baghdad accuses Damascus of um, sponsoring terrorist actions uh, uh, inside Iraq. Um, so once again, um, uh, regimes, regimes change, but Syria continues to be Syria, uh, Iran continues to be Iran, and Iraq is very much Iraq uh, in its relations, I think, with both of these countries. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Sunni Arab states to the south and west uh, I've engaged the leaders of all of those countries uh, directly during my time in Baghdad to, to make the basic point that if the Arabs are worried about undue Iranian influence, uh, uh, the best way to counteract it is with uh, some positive Arab influence, starting with reopening their embassies. Um, uh, we made uh, some headway on that. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Jordan, with uh, Kuwait, uh, with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain. Uh, the Saudis were uh, unmovable uh, on this. Um, and I think that uh, deep in the heart of the, uh, the Saudi leadership is the conviction that Iraq's new leaders are guilty of one unforgivable sin. Uh, what I would call GWS, Governing While Shia. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a tinge of sectarianism, uh, I think, throughout the peninsula, uh, but particularly acute in Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, that just viscerally does not accept uh, the new order inside Iraq. And I hope very much in the wake of these elections, uh, uh, whatever government emerges in Baghdad, that it will be an opportunity for uh, the Arabs of the Gulf, and particularly the Saudis, to um, uh, reassess their, uh, their ties and their posture. Um, so those are a few of the thoughts on my mind as I uh, uh, join you today from uh, uh, the beautiful spring of East Texas. Yeah. Uh, happy to have the opportunity and be pleased to entertain any of your comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. As you may have noticed, it's not just me thanking you, but the entire audience is th most thankful to you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, apologize for the few uh, problems, the technical problems, but we managed to have uh, we, by me, by we, I mean both your technicians and ours, and uh, managed to have overcome this uh, uh, precedented uh, problem. And um, uh, without further ado, I think there would be quite a number of questions, and I would appreciate very much, as long as you can stay with us, um, to uh, that we uh, uh, entertain. We have some members of the audience uh, ask their questions. So we'll see, maybe I'll have to repeat the question because the hall is rather packed here. So if um, uh, we figure, we learn that we, you can't really follow the questions, I'll repeat them so that, that you can take them one at a time. Um, and the thank, all the words of thanks I leave for the, for the end because uh, uh, I would like to make the best of all the time that you have in order to uh, um, benefit from your uh, knowledge and wisdom. Thank you, sir. Yes, questions, please. Noga, you are first. Dr. Frati, who is the uh, head of this uh, seminar. Takumi Noga, she is with me. Ambassador Coker, how do you see? Thank you. Thank you. The question was, um, how do you see the role of the U.S. in the upcoming years in Iraq? Uh, I, I see our relationship with uh, Iraq increasingly um, 
uh, governed by the strategic framework agreement uh, uh, and not the security agreement. Um, the security agreement, of course, provides for the full redeployment of U.S. forces by the end of 2011. The Obama administration has uh, unilaterally uh, set an intermediate date uh, for our force levels to be down to 50,000 by September 1, and those forces to be in a purely advisory and support role. Uh, uh, so the security agreement negotiated under President Bush, embraced by President Obama, uh, uh, will continue to govern the redeployment of our forces. Uh, uh, what will be important, as I tried to suggest, I think, is the, uh, uh, the full implementation of the strategic framework agreement uh, as a top U.S. priority. Uh, for example, uh, I would like to see thousands of young Iraqis in American universities. Uh, we have um, uh, a large number of them uh, already on this campus at Texas A&M. Um, that would also be part of the fundamental reorientation I mentioned, because literally for 50 years, very few Iraqis uh, had the opportunity to attend U.S. universities. Uh, now they do. The Prime Minister has a scholarship program that ambitiously aims at sending up to 10,000 young Iraqis uh, abroad for study each year. An enormous opportunity to help build a new generation of Iraqis uh, that have experience in the West, have the languages of the West, and appreciation of the West. Uh, something missing. Uh, literally for half a century. Uh, so I, I think uh, that we emphasize the importance of full implementation of the strategic framework agreement while continuing to play uh, uh, an active but unobtrusive political role uh, as Iraq wrestles with the, that long list of problems that I, I sketched out earlier. Um, uh, the Iraqi political system is still under development rather clearly. Um, and that means there is still an essential role for uh, an outside uh, moderator, if not an arbiter. Um, and I think we are uniquely equipped to play that role, um, uh, as is the United Nations, because I did not mention that earlier. Um, uh, in truth, I have not always been a fan of um, the United Nations. Um, uh, but I think over the last few years, they have played a, uh, a constructive and an effective role uh, in Iraq, particularly on the issue of elections. Uh, the last two special representatives of the Secretary General, uh, I think, have been very capable, very competent individuals who have had no allergies over working closely with the U.S. So uh, there is a role. Uh, as well for the United Nations. Um, and as I tell my European friends, uh, Iraq is a lot closer to you than it is to us. Uh, um, we know you've had, some of you had heartburn over 2003, but guess what? Um, it's now 2010. Um, whatever you thought about the invasion, get over it. Uh, uh, you know, the future starts now, and your active role uh, with the Iraqi government and people can help determine a future that is better for you than the past has been. So that's how I would see not just the U.S. engagement, um, but international engagement more broadly. Thank you, sir. A question in the back. Rene, Maksa, Dr. Zaidu. I repeat uh, the gist of the question. Who do you think, sir? Well, did you get it? I did. I can, I can hear very clearly. Okay, great. So you don't need my uh, charming voice to repeat it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it's an excellent question uh, uh, because, again, it underscores some of the issues I was talking about, but also the complexity of Iraqi politics. Uh, 
I, I mentioned the politics of fear. Um, there is a genuine, visceral fear of the return of the Ba'ath um, on the part of both uh, the Shia and Kurdish communities and indeed some Sunnis. Um, uh, so uh, de-Ba'athification is not just a political uh, tool to get rid of your opponents. Uh, it, is, it is deeply rooted in the, um, uh, the Iraqi psyche. That said, uh, it is also a tool to bash one's political opponents. And I think we saw both of these uh, strands twist together in the candidate disqualification. Um, uh, you know, was it driven by Iran? Um, it, it might have been, but I don't think that's decisive. Um, uh, uh, Iraqi politicians don't take orders from America, God knows, uh, uh, and they don't take orders from Tehran either. Um, uh, I, I don't need to uh, assume an Iranian hand in the um, disqualification decisions because I, I can interpret it simply in um, uh, Iraqi terms. Now, uh, what is the impact? Um, the disqualification of Salah al-Mutlaq, uh, I think, was a real challenge. And for a few days, um, uh, I feared that we were teetering again on the brink of um, uh, of a boycott, uh, but no boycott emerged, as as we saw. Sunni turnout uh, was uh, was very significant throughout the country, um, but we haven't heard the last of uh, uh, debathification. Um, uh, votes are being counted for the disqualified candidates, uh, uh, and a final determination will have to be made uh, on them. And I expect the Debathification Commission will continue its activities. Um, we'll see how the dynamic of a new government may affect that. But uh, again, the fear uh, that led to debathification uh, is going to be part of the political landscape, landscape for a long time to come. Uh, and Prime Minister Maliki per personally is very much informed by this fear. Uh, um, he fled the country in 1979, about two steps ahead of his Ba'athi pursuers, who killed a number of his colleagues in the Dawa party um, uh, and members of his family. I was in Iraq in 1980 uh, when uh, uh, Mohammed Bakr al-Assadr was uh, assassinated uh, by Saddam's agents. Um, uh, I remember that very clearly, and so does Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, so he, he personally, uh, I think, exemplifies that fear of the Ba'ath. Uh, that said, because he has the responsibilities of power, uh, uh, I think he has been much more uh, moderate on these issues uh, than some of his uh, Shia uh, uh, political colleagues. Uh, in um, in the context of these disqualifications, uh, I think the politics of the immediate pre-election period um, uh, led him to endorse the commission's decisions. Uh, it probably would have been extremely dangerous politically for him to have done anything else on the eve of the elections. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, sir, over there, please. Will you please present yourself so that they I'm Michael Gunter from Tennessee Tech, which gave your state Sam Houston as a governor, I believe. But anyway, my question is the future of federalism in Iraq. Uh, the Kurds would like to, of course, keep real federalism. I think uh, the Iraqi government would like to renegotiate what was voiced beyond them at an uh, unfortunate moment as they see it. Do you see federalism continuing? Also, do you really think the United States is going to take troops out of Iraq would we be there like we have been in uh, South Korea for the last half century? Thank you, sir. There, this was actually a double-edged question or a double question. <laughs> but you, you may pick up both ends, sides or just one element, whatever. But thank you, sir. Uh, I, it, nothing is forever in uh, politics, particularly Middle Eastern politics. Uh, but I, I, I think federalism in Iraq is going to be around for, for quite a while. 
Um, uh, uh, the Constitution is, of course... Uh, yes, we got you once again. The Constitution is both based on and um, frames a legal um, uh, definition of federalism. Uh, the, the Kurds, of course, insist on it. Um, uh, and if there is one thing that would literally drive them into the mountains and uh, into armed resistance again, it would be the um, abolition of federalism uh, in Iraq. But it's not just the Kurds. Uh, federalism is popular in the provinces. Um, uh, provincial governors and provincial councils like having uh, the best of all worlds uh, in which they get revenues from the central government, um, uh, but remarkable latitude in deciding how those revenues are used. Uh, so uh, federalism has a, uh, uh, a strong cons constituency, and that, I think, is a very good thing. Uh, uh, authoritarianism is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, you certainly see it in the federal government and the prime minister. But governors are also authoritarian. Uh, uh, they want to exert their authorities in their provinces uh, with minimum interference from the central government. Uh, so I, I see strong constituencies in favor of federalism. Um, uh, but again, nothing is guaranteed in what is still a very embryonic political system. In terms of the US military presence, uh, when we negotiated that agreement, uh, with a hard withdrawal date of the end of 2011, uh, there was certainly a sentiment uh, among our Iraqi interlocutors that said, look, we need a hard withdrawal date to put an end to the assertions of occupation, and particularly the, uh, 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 the assertion that this government is uh, selling out the national patrimony to long-term occupiers. So we'll put the date in, uh, and if it looks down the line like it makes sense to both of us uh, to adjust it, we can adjust it in a very different climate. Um, so we'll see what happens. I was interested to, to note statements by political figures in the run-up to the election, including Prime Minister Omaliki, uh, saying that, well, uh, uh, maybe some presence would be needed beyond 2011. Uh, that will be for a new government uh, to negotiate with the American government. Uh, uh, we'll just have to see what the circumstances are and what makes sense to both of us. Thank you. The backdrop of the uh, statement that published by the White House just before the elections. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, remind me which statement that was statement that supported the implementation of the Article 140. Uh, yeah, that that's a, has been a, a consistent view of this administration and of the, um, the previous administration. The, the trick, of course, is in how Article 140 is implemented. Uh, uh, we found it uh, prudent during my time there to have the United Nations uh, take a lead in the Article 140 process. Um, and they were quite active in uh, coming up with uh, possible alternatives um, for consideration by the parties. Um, uh, that eventually was caught up first in the 2009 provincial elections and then the 2010 national elections, um, but uh, 140 uh, uh, and Kirkuk and the whole range of Arab Kurd issues will be very much in the forefront uh, uh, as a new government uh, eventually takes office. I think we and the Iraqis have to be very careful in dealing with 140, and we must deal with it, n not to do it in a way that uh, could uh, destabilize uh, uh, Kirkuk or any other region. Um, uh, I think first we have to see how the elections shake out uh, in Kirkuk, uh, uh, both the city and the province. 
uh, than to see what is possible. Uh, I am a strong believer uh, that the primary voice in these matters should go to the people who live there. Uh, um, that uh, Kirkuk should not become a tennis ball in the match between Baghdad and Erbil. Um, and President Talibani, um, I think, has played a very uh, constructive role, uh, certainly at the time I was there and just after, in visiting Kirkuk, meeting with uh, all of its uh, representatives, um, and trying to use his influence to say that the people here are the ones who have to have a voice. And I think that's going to be key going forward. Final point I'd make is that 140 is not just about Kirkuk. Um, uh, there are a number of disputed internal boundaries um, uh, in Iraq, and uh, one of them that greatly concerns me uh, is the boundary between Anbar and Karbala. Um, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein lopped off what was then uh, Western Karbala uh, and gave it to Anbar because of his distrust of the, uh, uh, the Shia in Karbala. The Shia would like it back. Uh, uh, the tribes in um, uh, eastern Anbar there have made it clear that those are fighting words, and I believe them. So uh, in approaching 140, uh, while clearly the distortions of the Saddam regime should be set right, um, they, it, it, the whole process has to be approached with extreme care. It's um, kind of like dismantling a great big improvised explosive device uh, uh, because that's that's what 140 is throughout the country uh, Saddam wired it together um, uh, very good if you can dismantle it safely but for God's sake don't step on it thank you sir Go ahead. hi uh, Ryan Cocker Harold Road uh, a uh, question, please. Uh, first of all, the uh, uh, oh, okay, uh, <laughs> fine. Okay. First of all, the uh, question of um, the influence of what has happened in Iraq on the rest of the Arab world. It's interesting to note that in the Arabic of Iraq today, you're hearing an awful lot the word hope, talk about the future, and excitement about the future. And on the internet, you see people of other um, Arab countries who still live under the tyrannies and dictatorships. And you see that, that they're looking a lot to Iraq as a, sort of a model. If the people in Iraq can have freedom, democracy, if they can decide for themselves their future, why can't the rest of us? So my question is, first of all, how do you see the, uh, the uh, influence of the liberation of Iraq on the rest of the Arab world. Please question number two, the uh, uh, development of an Iraqi identity among the Arabs. I remember when I uh, was in Iraq in 2003 that I heard over and over again from people from Arabs saying, I'm not an Arab, I'm an Iraqi. And I said, well, wait a minute, you speak Arabic. And they said, well, you're an American. Uh, you speak English. Does that mean you're, you're, you're British? My, my question is, over and over again, their response was, the reason we don't want to consider ourselves Arabs is because the rest of the Arab world supported the Ba'athists and supported Saddam against us. How do you see these things? Thank you. Uh, well, those, those are uh, excellent questions. Uh, uh, in terms of the impact of the elections on the region, uh, obviously, it, it, it remains to be seen. I, I think for... Uh, uh, many in the region, and indeed for many in Iraq, um, uh, the critical thing is not the elections per se. It's going to be what type of government the elections produce, and then how effective that government is um, in actually giving opportunities uh, to the Iraqis for uh, education, uh, economic development in a context of pluralism and individual freedom. Um, my, my sense in the region, uh, both at a governmental level and at a popular level, is that the, the jury is still out on Iraq uh, for different reasons. Um, 
the official position, as I said, um, uh, has an inherent bias in many cases against a, a, a Shia-dominated government. For people, um, uh, I, I think they like what they see in terms of political expression, uh, but uh, I, th I, I think there is some significant um, uh, skepticism uh, over whether it will work, and therefore over uh, whether it is a um, something that they should be strongly pushing in their own countries. So it's another reason why our full coordinated efforts to help the Iraqis succeed is so important, uh, because it not only would be a strategic realignment of Iraq uh, with the West, uh, it, uh, it it could. Uh, over time lead to a democratic reshaping of an entire region. And I, I would broaden that to go beyond um, uh, the Arab world. I have to think that the, the Iraqi elections were closely watched in Iran, where Iranians saw, uh, with the, the, one, with the exception of Salah al-Mudlaq, uh, a, a range of political candidates that crossed the whole spectrum, rather than, uh, as one commentator put it, the a uh, pre-digested slate of acceptable candidates uh, that the Iranians are forced to choose from in their own elections. And the, 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 uh, the, the, the second part of that question? The Iraqi identity. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, an, I'm an Iraqi, I'm not an Arab, and this is among Sunnis and Shia. Yeah, it, I, I think I saw that uh, shift. Uh, in the spring of 2008, uh, when um, Iraqi forces went after Jaysh al Mahdi. Because um, uh, that, that's when I heard both Sunnis and Shia talking about an Iraqi Arab identity. Um, um, Iraqi always comes first. Um, and it is that common sense of Arab identity, though, that I think was a contributing factor to the. Uh, Arab Kurdish tensions that we're seeing now. Um, there was a, a vote in um, uh, mid 2008 on a, a draft of the provincial elections law when, when for the first time on a major national issue, uh, Arab Shia deputies sided with uh, Arab Sunni deputies uh, and defeated the Kurds in a parliamentary vote, leading to a Kurdish walkout. It had never happened uh, since 2004. Um, and it was, uh, again, a moment in which uh, the Arab identity of both Sunnis and Shia was affirmed, but with an equal and opposite reaction among the Kurds, who saw the bad old days coming back. Um, so again, uh, Iraqi identity, um, Arab identity, I think, a significant element now of the national psyche among the Arabs, uh, all of which has to be very, very carefully managed in what is, after all, a multi-ethnic federal state. Sir, would it be okay if we take a few, two or three more questions, or do you feel that you... Uh... If, if there is any remaining interest in having... Oh, we interest we've got lots of. Uh, let me tell you, let, let me caution you, there is more than interest, uh, judging by a few fingers that are still being raised. So if you can bear with us, let's have a uh, uh, yes, please. Um, could you please oh, okay. <laughs> speak to this camera, not to the screen, but to the camera. It's another very important question. Um, when we negotiated that agreement, uh, and particularly when we worked to ensure its passage through the Iraqi parliament, we were intensively engaged with all elements of the Iraqi political spectrum. Uh, and what we found almost universally um, was a sense that uh, the American, American military needed to stay. Uh, uh, that by no means meant that everybody liked us. Um, there was a, a sentiment I, we often heard that, well, 
you have messed this up uh, to the point of disaster. Now you're going to have to stay until it's fixed. Um, um, uh, you broke it. You may not own it, but you have a responsibility to repair it. Uh, this, this from some of our harshest critics. Uh, uh, so for different reasons, uh, a nearly universal belief that, uh, 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 that we needed to stay and that we may need to stay beyond 2011. Um, uh, so again, we'll have to see how things develop when a new government is in place, what that government wants to do, what circumstances are, and of course what Washington wants to do. Uh, but I, I would hope that all of us will keep an eye clearly on what's really important here, which is the emergence of a stable, secure, pluralistic Iraq, uh, and not on timetables um, uh, that may, may not be linked or support that outcome. I Thank you. I have concerns about a premature withdrawal. Speak um, on. As for your oh, yeah. 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 I, uh, uh, you know, this is something we, General Petraeus and I argued against um, when Congress uh, in 2007 was talking about cutting the funding. Uh, it would have been disastrous. Um, and if there were, for some reason, a decision made by either government, which I don't expect, to accelerate the agreed on withdrawal timelines, I, I would be very worried about that. Uh, uh, the end of 2011 is, is uh, still a long ways away in Iraqi time. Um, I think it's an issue that uh, we will have to actively discuss with the new Iraqi government probably fairly early on. But of all the various uh, scenarios or outcomes I see, uh, I think it would be highly dangerous to, uh, to try to accelerate uh, a withdrawal timetable. And I would judge that most Iraqis feel exactly the same way. Thank you. Yes, sir, over there. No, from the no, no, say the um, Address the camera. Okay. Yeah. Short, please. Your finisher, the voice of people in the Arabic. Um, in your uh, meeting with the um, uh, Iraqi uh, leaders, did you or they uh, mention uh, the name uh, Israel? Short. You know, it, it is very interesting. Um, for someone with long experience in the Middle East, where Arab-Israeli issues uh, uh, are so dominant and so contentious in so many capitals, uh, uh, Iraqi leaders were not really focused on Israel. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the subject seldom came up. Um, and I think it is a reminder that as central in, as it is in many respects, the um, the Arab-Israeli and the Palestinian-Israeli dispute in particular, um, uh, uh, it does not by any means account for the totality of politics in the Middle East. Uh, when the day comes, and I believe the day will come, uh, uh, when there is peace between Israelis and Palestinians, it will be a great and good thing, uh, but it will not fundamentally alter uh, the political landscape of the region. Uh, there was one notable incident uh, when Israel did come up. Uh, that was when an Iraqi parliamentary deputy uh, visited Israel uh, in 2008 and took part in a press conference. Uh, 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 his parliament voted to uh, suspend his membership, uh, effectively expelling him. Um, that case was taken to the Iraqi Supreme Court uh, and the court ruled in favor of the deputy, uh, uh, reinstating him as a member in good standing of the parliament and ordering the speaker of the Iraqi parliament to pay all his legal costs. Um, and uh, the interesting thing there is uh, the, uh, the reinstatement decision uh, caused barely a ripple uh, throughout Iraqi public opinion. Everybody was fine with it. Yes, you, you, you see, sir, this uh, gentleman, Al Alusi, even visited this particular place. He met with us and gave us a wonderful talk here. So, uh, but this, this uh, no, but no one held this against him. Uh, yes, Dr. Sabah. Uh, I would like to request you, sir, uh, to give us a 
us some details, to give us some details uh, from your uh, great knowledge concerning the terrorist uh, acts in Iraq in the last one year. Uh, the Iraq, some Iraqis leader accused Syrian or Iranian, but they are behind uh, these terrorist acts, while uh, Syria and Iran uh, claim that it is a local uh, act from Al-Qaeda and uh, the uh, recent Ba'athist uh, groups. Uh, I would like your opinion exactly, and when you think uh, these acts will be uh, diminished. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, that is also an excellent question, and I suspect the answer is all of the above. Um, uh, in, in the case of Syria, uh, uh, we have clear evidence of their support for al-Qaeda's transit. Uh, sometimes they bear down on it a bit. Uh, they may have been doing so recently, but uh, uh, it is a tap that they it is a tap they adjust uh, and have not chosen to turn off completely, um, and then of course the fact that they harbor senior Baathi officials like Izzat Ibrahim is uh, is, uh, is is public knowledge. Uh, uh, similarly with Iran, I think um, uh, groups like Saab Al Al Haq uh, clearly enjoy uh, Iranian patronage. Uh, a key figure there is someone I mentioned, uh, Qasem Soleimani, the Quds Force commander. Um, uh, and it is no coincidence that Soleimani has the primary policy implementation role for Iran in Iraq, as he does in Lebanon, as he does vis-a-vis -vis, um, Iranian support for uh, Hamas and uh, uh, the Islamic Jihad. And, of course, support going east for the Taliban. Uh, and I just parenthetically say one little remark to outcome of the uh, post-election turmoil in Iran is to expand Soleimani's mandate, uh, where he now has uh, an internal security responsibility that previously lay with uh, the Basij. So um, while Iran may be having its problems, uh, I think one of its um, most uh, effective and negative actors uh, Qasem Soleimani is uh, actually uh, gaining influence and power at least uh, at this time and this has to be very closely watched I think again uh, in Iraq certainly but also uh, in Lebanon and vis-a-vis -vis, um, Hamas. All of that said uh, I, I do believe there is an indigenous Iraqi Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, the the uh, attacks that we have seen in the run-up to the elections and indeed over the past year, uh, I would attribute to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, what I can't do is uh, adequately sort out uh, 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 how these attacks are directed and executed. Uh, in other words, what is regional Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, outside operators uh, and planners, and what is indigenous to Iraq. Uh, but I think it warns us all of the dangers of losing focus. Uh, uh, Al-Qaeda is an absolutely determined and dedicated enemy. Uh, uh, they are not going to be reconciled. They are not looking for excuses to get into the insurance business. Uh, they will keep on coming. Uh, and we have to make an enormous concerted effort in Iraq with the Iraqis uh, it is increasingly a, an intelligence matter rather than a military matter, but we've got to bring all the resources we can to bear uh, to ensure that Al-Qaeda does not regain the ground uh, it lost in uh, 2007. Thank you, sir. You, uh, our time is just about up, uh, but we haven't exhausted all questions, as you may well have uh, guessed. Uh, this doesn't apply only to the few people whom we disappointed, by not uh, referring to them even though they raised their hands and I apologize for that but it present company included I also didn't dare ask my questions because I thought it would be unfair towards the members of the audience but um, I would like very much to say one or two points make one or two points first of all you know sir 
uh, that uh, it's um, quite a routine procedure in conferences, almost a, pro a matter of protocol, that we have that people have someone deliver a keynote address, give them more important or less important, but definitely crucially. Uh, and this is fine. In our case today, it wasn't just a matter of protocol. It was a learning experience for us. And you hear it from a university professor, retired that he is, but still uh, with about 40 years of, of uh, experience. It was a very important learning experience for which we are all thankful to you, sir. Uh, you, you rightly pointed out that there are a few NOAS here in the audience. And, uh, but what you pro proved to us is that as many NOAS as we may be, a person who combines both the knowledge and the experience of having served in the field, as it were, um, is, uh, becomes a, a, almost an, a, an elementary and, and most important uh, addition and, and, and laying grounds to such a conference as ours. What I, uh, I noticed, and I believe some of my colleagues did the same, is not just the sense of reality that you added to, um, to this uh, conference, uh, drawing upon your own very rich experience, but also the element of optimism, or should I say cautious optimism. It's very easy to, um, you know, to say, well, these Iraqis, they, they have already or just about a civil war, it may come up again, they have such long deliberations and so on and so forth. No, what you added is not just a sense of decency and, and respect towards these people who are the object of our interest, academic interest, but um, this cautious optimism towards a better future, which is a very important element, not just to scholars, but to, for people like ourselves uh, who live in this part, or as you call it, in this rather uneasy neighborhood um, uh, of the world. Uh, I would once again like to thank you, for, sir, for such a wonderful presentation and such a patient and taking of all, so patiently, all the questions uh, for which we apologize, but we don't regret. We enjoyed it immensely, and I would end up um, by way of extending you an invitation to come, when you come again to this area, um, uh, please, be, uh, please get in touch, because we would very much like to reciprocate a little bit by way of showing you around and entertaining you at our university and in our institute. Thank you very much, Dean Crocker. Professor Cohen, and, and thanks to all of you. Uh, uh, the, the caliber of the questions uh, uh, certainly tells me that this will be a very successful conference, and I, I, I hope it does produce a report because you, you have brought together people who I think could um, uh, very usefully inform uh, the broader community uh, in Israel, in the U.S., and outside uh, of, of what's important and why it's important in Iraq. Uh, uh, I would say my only regret uh, is not being able to be with you in person, uh, so I uh, very much do accept your invitation, and you will find me knocking on your door on my next visit to Israel. Looking forward to it, sir. Looking forward, impatiently. Thank you once again. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>